Lord, we're going to read 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 8. Supplications for all men. I exhort, therefore, that, <clears throat> first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Amen. Again, reading verse number one, it says, I exhort, therefore, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. To exhort is to urge strongly. So he was making an appeal to Timothy, his son in the faith, to pray for all men, which one would think that everyone that he had ministered to, in order that the grace of God and the blessings of God would be upon them. However, the Apostle Paul even meant more than just those to whom he had ministered to, for he mentioned all men. And one would think that this also meant that he would pray for the women and the children too, in his mind. For even though it is not explicitly expressed, it is inferred. And even the other versions in English do mention it is either everyone or all people. Since the Apostle Paul also urged them to pray for all, it is also intended that they would pray for himself too, and those in leadership. But that would mean also not just in the church, leadership in the church, but the politicians too. For those who may have an effect on freedom, and that they may, that is the church, have freedom of movement and freedom of services and in the kind of services that the apostolics would have. A supplication appears to mean in the way one requests something. To supplicate means a humble and earnest entreaty, pleading for mercy on their behalf. And to mediate is to be the goal between asking, asking God for a certain person. Thus, it may sound as though he is asking basically the same thing. Supplications, prayers, and intercessions. But when you look at the definition of supplications, it helps us to realize that the Apostle Paul was stating that one should humbly ask God in treating for another person. Therefore, the way in which one comes to God is not, shall we say, pleasing or praying for them to do harm to those people or bring judgment upon them or the, 
kind of remember what they did to me, uh, praying to God that way, kind of attitude. Instead, the attitude is coming to God in a very meek and a humble way, earnestly pleading to God on their behalf. And one could also say, realizing that we, too, have failed in one way or another, or a multitude of ways, and we need his help just the same. And verse number two says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It is true that the Apostle Paul wished that the plea would be made for all men, which includes just that, everyone. However, here he specifies a needful area to supplicate God humbly for those that are in authority, the political leaders as well as spiritual leaders. For if there is that freedom to worship God freely, there will be no need to hide the truth in about what someone is really doing, where one is, and so on. And that also allows for openness about the truth of God, of the gospel, and not have to worry about getting in trouble by law for sharing one's faith or declaring one's faith. Thus, the ideal is to live a life in quietness and peacefulness, in godliness and honesty, too. That as one might say, the goal for a life pleasant in Christ. Verse number three says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. One wonders what God would think in this regards. Well, here it is. To have a community or even a nation that would be good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, is to have one that we as Christians can live in honesty and peacefulness and godliness and quietness. When one sees that there are those who live in the world, and there are those who live for God, and these live side by side, and the Christians for their sake, and for the sake of others that do not believe, through their prayers, through their supplications for others, for the sinners, and for the sake of living as noted above, quietness, peacefulness, godliness, honesty. God accepts this and thinks that it is good. That is acceptable in his sight. Because we know that God has given mankind a choice. And that is something that he has allowed mankind, a choice, to choose to serve God or be an unbeliever. And so we have people that are living side by side, Christians and non-Christians. Verse number four, it says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? That is, God wishes all men, all people, everyone to be saved. He wants that. And that's how uh, that's his deep desire. I would I would say that it's his desire, his deep desire more than other things that are going on in the universe. His goal, his desire is for mankind to be saved, to 
come to to have them come to the knowledge of the truth. No doubt the church is that door for others within the community to receive the knowledge of the truth, to be saved, to live, to have an understanding of how to live a life of godliness and contentment. Here the apostle shares, though, another thought for all men that they would be saved. Okay, so God's thoughts, of course, are higher, much higher than man's thoughts. And the ideal is for God that mankind would choose eternal life rather than eternal death. To have men come to the knowledge of the truth is one thing, and the other is to be saved. Through the truth, we can learn how to be saved. And so it's very important to understand the truth of how to be saved. God wishes, of course, all men to understand that truth or come to that truth and also to be saved. He wants both. He wishes that men would be saved, come to the knowledge of truth. Amen. Verse number five, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And here the Apostle Paul shares to us, the church, who the mediator between God and men is. That is, the man, or the humanity of Christ Jesus, he specified that it was the man, Christ Jesus. He mentions that Christians should be praying like a mediator between God and man. But the ultimate mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. That is God who had decided to come to the earth, to come and share his life on earth as a human being in order to save mankind. He became, as a human being, he became that mediator. He allowed, he made it possible for himself to become a human being so that he could mediate that between God and man. We know that there is only one God concept of God that can never, ever be changed, for God is only one, and that there is no other God. When God revealed himself in flesh, that is, the human form, he became a human being. God did not cease to be God, and that means that he is still as God, invisible, he is still immortal, he's still eternal, but when he became a man, he, he put himself into the human life, which, of course, as a human being, or that particular role, he had a beginning. Not as God, because God is eternal, but as a human being, he had a beginning. He also was born, that is, the human being, and he walked, lived, ate, drank. As God, he no, doesn't need food. He provided food. As God, he doesn't need to drink water. He is the water of life. He is the fountain of life. But as a human being, just like any other man, just like everyone like we are, well, he had to drink, to eat, to walk. He had limitations. He put those limitations upon himself when he became a human being. He had to pray as well, not only just to show mankind, but also because he put himself in that limitation of a human being. And as a human being, he died because they put him to death. Amen.
but he resurrected. And so he was able to offer to mankind that way to become saved and offer the Spirit of God and offer forgiveness of sins and offer healing through his stripes. So when God revealed himself in flesh, the human form, God did not cease to be God, but he was playing a different role in the role of a human being in this life. Verse 6 says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God manifest himself in flesh, and then, as such, he gave himself a ransom that will, in due time, as it states, be testified about. That is, as the church grows and begins its testimony to others here and there, in one country and another, from nation to nation, from city to city, from village to village, to town to town, from one place to another, the testimony about Jesus Christ will keep on growing. That is, it will never cease to exist. It will continue on forever. The greatest testimony of all time, in fact, is what Jesus Christ has done for us. For humanity, there is no other testimony greater than his, the testimony of Jesus. Not only for the fact of what he had done for humanity, but also because of himself giving of himself, therefore, he is also able to change the lives of human beings. That is, if they accept the gospel message, they repent of their sins. They're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That and be filled with the Holy Ghost. In reality, then, because of what Jesus Christ had done on the cross and for humanity, it follows that he is the one who can change the lives of humanity better than anyone else. But it can only happen that way if that person allows that to happen. There's where the clinch, the, um, the will is. The person has to allow it to happen. The person has to will it to happen. Verse number seven, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Here the apostle Paul explains to Timothy what office he held. A preacher and an apostle. Here he was saying, of course, he was not lying, but he was, in fact, telling the truth. And one could say that Jesus is the one who called him into the ministry, which is true, no doubt. Therefore, if there were any that had stated that he was not, then it would be that they were persecuting the ministry or in Jesus' decision-making ability, which we could say is the best in the entire universe for us and for everyone. If we are to judge another man of his own ministry, are we judging Jesus Christ and who he has decided to come into the ministry? For it is by him that we move, we live, and have our being. Amen. But he explained that he was not only a preacher and an apostle, that is, Paul, but he was also a teacher. He was trying to get the Gentiles into the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, to know him, that is Jesus, for certain. And then he shared with them the truth. To be ordained where it says, whereunto I am ordained a preacher. 
according to Webster's, is to introduce into the office of the Christian ministry by the laying on of hands or by other forms. Of course, that is the de dictionary definition. To those who are in ministry and to some organizations, this might include the possibility of entering into an office in the district rather than only the office of ministry amongst the local church. And that would be only if one is part of an organization. According to Webster's, though, it also has the idea of others laying on of hands for one to be ordained and to be thought of as the highest class of individual minister without any role in the district of which one resides if the church be independent per se but if the church be part of any organization then it would be presumed that the organizational leaders be present to ordain a pastor or a minister by that would be a ceremony and that would be leaders of the organization present to pray for the person. Yet churches are in essence independent though they belong to an organization. Therefore it is quite possible for the local church to ordain a minister. They are independent. Let us read about what happened in the life of the Apostle Paul. It states, Acts 13, 1-3, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. What seemed to be happening here in this particular verse is the fact these verses, is the fact that the church had a meeting. The church was located in Antioch, and what, sh what was so interesting was this fact. The Apostle Paul, when on his journey to Damascus, was visited by Jesus outside of Israel, presumably. And in this Antioch church also, it was outside of Israel too. I did say also, so also and two are together here. I should just take one of those out. Thus, the first calling he had received was outside of Israel. The second, too, outside of Israel. The Holy Spirit guided the ministers of the church as a whole, in the, we could say, second calling, to separate Paul and Barnabas for the work that he had called them to do which meant going to the Gentiles. And the calling was in Gentile hand, lands. Two. This was quite some time after Paul had received his first calling from Jesus Christ. One was on a more personal level. The other was on a church level. One calling was recognized by a witness, Ananias. Well, he was there and one to bring Saul the news about his calling. During the second, there were more witnesses, and the Holy Ghost too, being a witness. Well, the first one was Jesus, we could say. Both Paul and Barnabas were called to go to the Gentiles. And since they were already in Gentile lands, they could have stayed right where they were, and they would be preaching to Gentiles. But the idea was to go. So it meant that they were to travel to other areas, and not just there in Antioch, Syria. Thus they took the journey to go in the area towards Europe and establish churches. 
The other account of meeting with the elders in Jerusalem was a different account. It was not in Antioch there, but it was in Jerusalem, where this particularity, particularity happened with Paul. First, the elders had recognized that Paul had done had many miracles follow his ministry, and there were many Gentiles that were brought into the faith by him ministering to the Gentiles. So that regarded, they regarded that calling of him going to the Gentiles. He was more successful there. In Galatians chapter 2, 7 to 10, it says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would, that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Here it seems that the Apostle Paul again was rewarded with others that sided with them that they were going to go to the Gentiles or have their ministry among, amongst them. And these were James, the brother of Jesus, Cephas, who would be also called Peter, John, the Apostle John, the beloved one of Jesus, who was, much, who was then much older and part of the church. And it states, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go into the heathen and they into the circumcision. Thus, there seems to be a work that was happening, yes, by Paul and Barnabas, actually, to the Gentiles. Let us put this into context. The Apostle Paul was called by Jesus Christ. Maybe one can label that like a lo local license. Later, it could be deemed a, gen a general license when they were called by the Holy Spirit. Finally, it could be considered ordination as the elders gave them right hands of fellowship. That's just a, an opinion there. The elders at Jerusalem were likened possibly into the leadership of the organization rather than just the church level. So we have the entire organization basically. While the church at Antioch was a Christian church and that which the Holy Spirit used to send the apostle, apostles Paul and Barnabas, yet the idea is though, even though the apostle Paul may not have, quote unquote, received the right hands of fellowship from the elders in Jerusalem as of yet, or even if he had not received the calling at Antioch, he was still under obligation by Jesus Christ to be in the ministry. So all of that extra was good and beneficial for him and encouraging to him. But he still, when we go back to the first calling, he was still <laughs> put into the ministry by Jesus Christ. There are extra things that we might go through and Encouraging words that we might hear from God's Spirit and from other people, but still we have an obligation when Jesus calls. And so he was called by the second time by the Holy Ghost and gave him that key to his ministry where basically we could say the Holy Ghost gave him the key to the ministry where he would be successful because God knows everything about who would actually listen more and God of course has a desire for us to be successful in ministry and he will lead us to those people 
that we will be successful with. Later, as that success, of course, was heard by the elders, then they, in their humanity, in their human way, understood that that, that was that area where he was successful and that God was with them, of course. Well, God would be with them anywhere they go, but that was just where God had helped him to become su successful with the Gentiles. And though sometimes we may not evaluate success by numbers, it was, in essence, the will of God. I would imagine that the will of God would be for a person uh, where one is most su successful in Jesus Christ among people, for God's will, that more people listen, more people obey the truth. Though some will be obstinate with the ministers of God, and it should be with patience, one might say, that one may lead others into the truth. However, one must also distinguish, if it be that others are not receptive to the truth, one should go where they might accept the truth in time and with patience. However, we do have an example of Jesus Christ, who himself, when he was growing up in Nazareth, and he knew those people, they knew him. But something happened when he preached one particular day, and it only took one message from Jesus. Something came out of him that was much different than before. He was showing who he was at that time. And so there was a, a difference there of that presentation of who he really was, and they decided to reject that. See, they knew him, yes, as a, a regular human being, but when he presented himself in a different light, that he was the Messiah, God in flesh, that is what they rejected. And that turned the tide, it changed. So Jesus in Nazareth, the place where he had grown up, gone to the synagogue all those years. He was in the synagogue and there he began to preach, but he changed his preaching to something of showing himself who he was to the Nazarenes. But they eventually, when hearing this message, his message of who he was, Basically telling him, telling them that he was the Messiah. They fully rejected it. One could say that Jesus was in truth the Messiah. So Jesus just proclaimed himself as the Messiah to the Nazarenes. But they fully and totally rejected his claim. Thus Jesus decided immediately to move on. To go someplace else. But even though he went to Capernaum. That does not mean that all of the people accepted him there either, for there he had noted of the judgment of God that would come upon them for not receiving that which that one that was greater. Amen. Than even Solomon and all his wisdom, and it was not like Jesus had gone out to worship other gods by uh, of other nations either, for he sought out those true worshippers. And those who would be true worshipers of himself, in any case, which would in future time be, amen, alleluia, the church body. The church body would be the true worshipers of Jesus Christ. Thus, the Apostle Paul, if one looks at his life, was called by Jesus. But later, one can say he was prayed for, he was sent meaning that that particular act might have been similar to offering him ordination. Of course, in the Old Testament, such ministers were not in um, essence, existence. They were not in existence. It was only after the fact that Jesus Christ had died, had risen, and ascended. And these types of ministers were given to the church and for the purpose of ministry. 
Thus one has to be careful and watch with all one's eyesight and prudence, for the devil looks to somehow trip one up on his way to that highest calling, so to speak, of a minister. The enemy would like to see him tripped up totally, but the angels, Jesus Christ and the heavenly host, would like to see the person in total victory. Amen. In verse number 8, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. Having men pray everywhere, that was the thing that the people of God, yeah, they can do. They have that liberty in Christ. But they should also lift up their holy hands without wrath, without anger, without doubting. Thus, to worship Jesus Christ is to worship with one's hands raised in belief and admiration, giving Jesus Christ the glory. Nevertheless, it seems that here there is also something very notable, too. And what is noted is the following. It makes no difference where one finds himself. One should lift up holy hands unto God in prayer, if that is where he wants to pray. If one is in one's house, one is in a boat, one is on the road, in his car, on a motorcycle, uh, be careful of driving, though. And though one is in a public restaurant or wherever one may be, to pray something that the children of God can do. And giving of thanks. One prays to give thanks in a restaurant for his food. Yet there are other reasons, too. Amen. And one should not be uh, lifting up hands because of anger, of redoubting, but one should do so the purpose of belief in God and praise to him. That is what the Apostle Paul had told Timothy. Amen. And may God bless you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.